Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of pregnancy and arthritis. I would like to begin, however, by acknowledging the tradi traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting this evening, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. On behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'm very happy to provide you with a list of our free consumer webinars for 2021. We have a great and diverse list of topics. If you haven't already registered for the whole webinar series or for individual webinars, uh, you can do so on our website. When you visit our website, you'll also find an extensive, extensive range of information, films and videos, apart from our other initiatives and services, such as our peer support groups, our MSK Kids program, our MSK e-newsletter and our national MSK helpline. If you haven't already seen it, I urge you to also read the report of our National Musculoskeletal Consumer Survey, which we undertook last year. The survey report is titled Making the Invisible Visible and details the physical, emotional, financial and social impact of musculoskeletal conditions on people living with the conditions. It certainly makes for powerful reading. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Claire Barrett. Claire studied medicine at University College London and after working in London for several years, she completed her rheumatology training in Queensland. She was appointed as visiting medical officer at Redcliffe Hospital in 1996 and she initiated a public specialist rheumatology service, which now is expanded to four rheumatologists, an advanced trainee and a nurse. Claire is involved in education of medical students, registrars and GPs, and is passionately committed to improving access to high quality rheumatology care for all patients in Queensland Health. She is currently chair of the Australian Rheumatology Association's Policy and Advocacy Committee, a member of the ARA Database Steering Committee, and current vice president of the ARA. Claire's research interests include rheumatoid arthritis and pregnancy, telehealth and regional rheumatology. In her free time, Claire enjoys park runs on the Redcliffe Peninsula with her husband, cherishing visits from any of their five children and three grandchildren. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Claire. Thanks very much, Claire. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I have to say I must update my website because we've actually got four grandchildren now. but. Tonight, we're going to talk about pregnancy and arthritis. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but I will do my best to answer any general questions at the end. So just to um, put in place, I have a few conflicts to declare. There's nothing that has influenced the content of this presentation tonight. So we're going to talk about just uh, a reminder of what is arthritis. And I know some of you who may have listened to other webinars in this series have had that covered, but for those who haven't, I'll just cover it again. Pregnancy outcomes, particularly focusing on rheumatoid arthritis, what one should consider doing and what should one avoid doing. So what is arthritis? Now, it, arthritis refers to more than 100 different conditions. And for the scholars of Greek or Latin amongst you, it comes from the word for joint, arthron or artis, and then itis means inflammation. So we broadly look at a normal joint where there is the cartilage, which is on top of or the bottom of the bones. And then in a degenerative arthritis, that cartilage gets broadly worn out. Whereas in rheumatoid arthritis, one of the inflammatory arthritis, this lining of the joint or the synovium becomes thickened. So a joint will become swollen because the lining's thickened and it's producing lots of fluid. And then that thickened lining can damage the bone or erode it, which results in the deformities. So, Rheumatoid arthritis, just to remind the audience, or for those who are not familiar with the concept, it's an autoimmune disease. So everyone knows about 
viruses now and how bodies make antibodies to the viruses. Sometimes our bodies get confused and they make antibodies against ourselves. And that's the hallmark of an autoimmune disease. So rheumatoid arthritis is probably missed, misnamed in that it's actually rheumatoid disease. So it does affect joints, which become painful, swollen, stiff, warm, and tender, but it can affect other parts of the body. Although these are much less common in the 2020s than they were in the 1950s, but there are some people who have skin disease and lung disease. So the message that we are trying to convey, and it's obviously sentinel to MSK Australia with their message of how long uh, it took for that person to get diagnosed and treated, is that untreated disease leads to damage, deformity, disability, whereas early treatment results in less damage. And that early treatment, we like to focus on this concept of disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs or colloquially DMARDs. So these DMARDs fall into a number of groups and to just set the scene for this evening, the ones on the left side of your screen are what are referred to as conventional synthetics, so you could even label them old-fashioned. And the ones on the right are the targeted, which include the more recently known phrase of biological, but there are also some newer medicines, which are tablets that are also targeted. And the ones on the right are very expensive, and the ones on the, less, on the left are less expensive, but often very effective. So what about pregnancy in rheumatoid in Australia? Now these um, numbers have been extrapolated, but According to what I can find, there are just over 25 million Australians in the year 2020. And if you look at the age distribution and that childbearing age is regarded as between 15 and 45, and we all know there are outliers within outside those age groups, that's about 20% of the population. And there is debate about how many Australians have rheumatoid arthritis, and it depends on whether you look at a very strict criteria or patient reported, but if we say 1%, so that means somewhere between 50,000 50, women of childbearing age have rheumatoid. And if we look at the best figure I could find, which is the average birth rate per thousand women in 2018 in Australia, there's at least 3,000 rheumatoid arthritis related pregnancies each year in Australia. And that's probably a gross underestimate. So it's not a small issue. So we're going to look at what is the effect of rheumatoid arthritis on pregnancy? Well, very simply, the data does say that if you have rheumatoid arthritis, it may take a longer time for you to conceive or get pregnant. We know that severe rheumatoid arthritis with poor disease control is associated with an increased risk of stillbirth, premature babies, cesarean section, and low birth weight. What is not so clear is on the risk of miscarriage and high blood pressure and preeclampsia, because there are some studies that show an increased risk and other studies that show the same risk as the general population. So when I was a medical student, we were definitely taught that rheumatoid arthritis gets better in pregnancy. And that's what's published. But that was looking back saying, yeah, it got better. And then in the early, in 2008, there was quite a good study that looked at people who had definite rheumatoid, so blood test positive rheumatoid, and only about 40% got better. And less than a quarter actually got really better. And then in 2017, while it was identified that up to about 70% of people got better or stayed the same, 30% of people who with rheumatoid arthritis who became pregnant, their disease got worse. So it doesn't always get better. And what about after pregnancy? Well, we were also taught that you would always have a flare 
after you had your baby. And certainly in the late 1990s, between 80 and 90% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis who'd been fabulous during pregnancy had a flare within the first few months. But in 2008, there was only about 40% of people who flared at six months. And some of that is either there was identification of a pregnancy compatible medication and the patient continued it all the way through, optimizing the outcomes for them and their baby, or they restarted the medication very rapidly, not waiting for their disease to flare. So just to ask, answer that question, I have rheumatoid or another type of arthritis, what should I know about having a baby? So you should be aware that active disease or recurrently flaring disease can be harmful for the mum, but also can have adverse outcomes for the baby. We talked about prematurity. So knowing that the higher disease activity can be a risk, how can we try and assist in getting better disease control? So we need to look at what medications are safe or what we would call pregnancy compatible and what medicines are going to be harmful and therefore definitely should be stopped. So just to set the scene, um, this was a, a lovely patient who was diagnosed four years before I saw her and she'd been treated pretty well with some of these disease modifying medications and her disease was controlled. And she was very keen to have a family and was under the impression she had been told that she had to stop all her medication and there were no other options. So her disease became less well controlled and noting that it took more time than average to get pregnant, it was 12 months. And she said, I felt really, really awful. So she did get pregnant and she described herself as being well. But in actual fact, during the pregnancy, she had taken medication, so steroids. And after the pregnancy, her disease flared very badly and she needed a large dose of steroids. So she went on to have another pregnancy. And during that time, she felt that she was doing the right thing to remain off medications and she actually delivered two healthy twins but i just wanted to show a picture of her wrist so i met her when she struggled to lift up her twins and on the right i hope you can see my mouse this is what a wrist is meant to look like and this is what her wrist looked like so she had done what she thought was the right thing. She'd been told that she shouldn't take any medications. But as a result of that, her disease had been what can only be regarded as rampant and severe and produced these damages or holes or what we call erosions. So unfortunately, there's no going back from that. And I suppose what I'm trying to get across is we need to balance about what's best for the pregnancy and the babies and what's best for the mum, knowing that mum's going to be looking after that baby and need to lift up the baby and be with them for the rest of their lives. So that brings us on to what to do before we talk about what not to do. So what to do. So I think the message that I'm trying to get across is we need to balance the risk of stopping a medication to protect the baby from possible harms to risk of the active rheumatoid arthritis, which I hope I've illustrated, can harm the baby and the mum. Mums are going to put up with anything, but there is evidence that having poorly controlled rheumatoid arthritis during pregnancy can have adverse outcomes for the baby by themselves. So what I would say is get the best evidence to help you make your decisions. And the, this area is changing all the time. So we're going to talk about pregnancy safe or pregnancy compatible medications. So one of the um, 
our recommendations for preparation was to look at resources. And I've only picked one resource. There are some others around, but we've written this short document. It's just two pages on medications and pregnancy in rheumatoid arthritis. And I'll come back to that towards the end. So it goes through a variety of medications, anti-inflammatories. In theory, they should be stopped when you're planning a pregnancy. But there are many people who've conceived on Nurofen over the counter and things like that. So the thought is if it's possible to avoid, do so. It was the older studies that suggested there might have been an increased risk of miscarriage, but the newer ones don't support that. So if you can't function without an anti-inflammatory, it is an acceptable option. However, towards the end of pregnancy, it is required that anti-inflammatories be stopped because otherwise there can be a problem with one of the blood vessels in the baby's heart. What about breastfeeding? So anti-inflammatories can be used when patients are breastfeeding. Uh, a breastfeeding mum might get mastitis and mastitis can be treated with antibiotics, but often anti-inflammatories are used. A mum who might have had a cesarean section would be prescribed an anti-inflammatory after the operation. They're not told they can't breastfeed. So just be aware it is reasonable to use an anti-inflammatory. These are chosen, these two are chosen over others because they're shorter acting. So low-dose aspirin, we'll come to talk about a little later with lupus, uh, does reduce the risk of blood pressure problems. And there are, depending on the disease, depending on the circumstances, it can be taken all the way through pregnancy. It can be taken at eight weeks of pregnancy. Ooh. I'm gonna ignore that. Um, and it can be uh, stopped depending on the individual circumstances. So, what about steroids or corticosteroids? This is the term for prednisolone, glucocorticoids. The older studies did report an increased risk of cleft palate, but the more recent studies show that there's no link. So they are can be used in pregnancy, but the evidence is think of something else if possible. So they use them if they're not, the other medicines are not adequate, the other medicines for whatever reason are not appropriate or the other medicines are poorly tolerated. The message would be use the smallest dose possible, less than five if at all possible, definitely less than 20. If you're breastfeeding and you're on more than 20 milligrams a day, the aim is to feed the baby about four hours after the dose. So why do I think we should look at alternatives to steroids when I just said they were safe? Well, because there is more, a, a body of evidence that now says there is delayed conception, there is definitely increased blood pressure, and that's whether you're taking them for asthma or inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid, diabetes, increased weight, and bone thinning, what we call osteopenia or osteoporosis. There is a definite increased risk of infection in, and it is related to dose, and it is more common in the last third of pregnancy. So the smaller the dose, the less risk, but any is associated with the risk. Mother gets an infection, that's gonna be a risk to the baby. In the, in the baby, the fetus, there is again, increased risk of premature rupture of membranes, premature babies, and either low worth birth weight babies or high birth weight. So what about the pregnancy safe DMARDs? So it's been shown that the outcomes for mother and baby are more optimal than steroids with four different medications. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil, which many people heard of last year when it was suggested by some members of the community to be the cure for COVID-19, which of course it's not. Sulfasalazine or salazopyrene, azathioprine or imuran, 
and this group of medications called the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors of which there are more than 10 available in Australia now and they are one of the biologics. So I'm going to briefly go through each of those medications if time permits. Hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil can be used during conception and pregnancy and it should be used in patients with lupus. So it's clearly been shown that in pregnant women with lupus or SLE, the ongoing use of this medication is associated with improved pregnancy outcomes and breastfeeding should not be discovered, sorry, discovered, discouraged. Um, it's an extremely safe medicine for mother and the fetus and should not be stopped before, during or after pregnancy. And that's an important message and not all medical practitioners and certainly not all obstetricians understand that. So sulfasalazine or salazopyrene can also be used during conception and pregnancy. Because it is a folate antagonist, so blocks folic acid, it is recommended that if you are on this medication that you have more than the standard pregnancy folic acid dose. So five milligrams and it should be commenced a month before pregnancy and continued throughout. Breastfeeding should not be discouraged. So azathioprine or Imuran, which has a lot of data from the world of transplants where patients with kidney transplants who have mother children, uh, it can be used during conception and pregnancy. And the dose is slightly lower than we would generally have a, as our upper limit. Breastfeeding, again, should not be discouraged. So what about the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, these biologicals? So there's a US study that has suggested up to 20% of rheumatoid arthritis patients will have one of these medications partly or throughout pregnancy. There's now published thousands of pregnancies exposed and there are no increased risk of miscarriage. There's no increased risk of congenital malformations or infections in the baby over the rheumatoid arthritis population. So they can be used in conception and pregnancy. What time you have to stop it or is recommended to stop it depends on the type of medication you're on. So some of these might be given once a week or once a fortnight or once every four weeks. And the decision to stop, it's usually for most of them in the second and third trimester because this is an antibody like we talked about at the beginning. And we actually want our antibodies to cross from mum to baby because it protects the baby against infections until it makes its own antibodies. So these antibodies cross the placenta and therefore, in theory, might increase the risk of infections in the babies, which I just said it doesn't seem to. But the big crunch is if the treatment has been continued by the mother past the second or third trimester, depending on the specific medication, live vaccines, which in Australia is the rotavirus and the BCG vaccine, which is not for everybody, should be avoided. Now, there's an exception to this, which is one of the medicine called sertolizumab or Simsia, and that has been tweaked slightly so that it does not cross the placenta at all. And there have been some super studies where very generous mums who've had their baby have allowed the level of this to be looked at in their babies, in their blood, in their breast milk. So uh, again, individual, look at the medication that is right. And if your disease is active and you need to continue it all the way through, which I have looked after patients and that's been the decision, the only issue is avoiding these live vaccines. So what not to do? So don't panic, don't give up the thought of a pregnancy, but don't give up disease control and don't ignore advice. 
So what about an unplanned pregnancy? 30% of pregnancies in Australia are unplanned. So some patients may fall pregnant on medications that we don't really want them to be pregnant on because of risks. So these are the medicines we're going to discuss. So methotrexate, the most widely used disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug in Australia. When I'm talking to someone who's got new onset of rheumatoid and I say to them, look, this is the best treatment and there's only two reasons why I would not give it to you. One, if you've got really bad kidney disease and it's hard to choose the right dose. And the second is if you tell me you want to get pregnant in the next six months. The reason I say six months is because it takes up to three months to work. And then I'm saying you need to stop it three months before planned pregnancy. So what happens if you're on methotrexate and you conceive or your partner conceives? So immediately stop the methotrexate, immediately take a lot of folic acid and immediately get an appointment with an expert. Do not take advice that this is an untenable pregnancy. There are many pregnancies where an, have been conceived while the patient's on methotrexate that haven't miscarried and the end product has been a beautiful, healthy baby and even twins. So get advice from people who understand the whole situation. So leflunamide or Arava. Now this is a medication that takes a long time to work and a long time to get out of the system. If there is a planned pregnancy, unless it's been more than two years since the patient has been on it, then you should use a washout with a medicine called cholestyrene, cholestyramine, which is an old fashioned cholesterol lowering medication. What about an unplanned pregnancy? Again, stop the medication, have the washout, get an appointment with an expert. Don't take advice from people who don't understand the whole situation. So the non-TNF inhibitor biologics, and there'll be some people in the audience who understand this concept, but in the um, news over the last year, in addition to hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil being utilized for treatment of COVID-19 and been shown to be ineffective, one of the medicines from rheumatoid arthritis called tocilizumab or Actemra has been shown to be effective in the patients who've had really bad COVID. Now this includes some pregnant women and there has just been a statement that says, if a patient is pregnant and requires tocilizumab, they should have it. And if they've had it in the last trimester of pregnancy, their baby should not receive live vaccines. So that was updated as of yesterday. So what's really bad? So there's this medicine called mycophenolate or Celsept or myofortic. And it's not used much for rheumatoid, it's used more for lupus, but it is very damaging to a fetus. So it only needs to be stopped six weeks before, but it absolutely needs to be stopped. And in the UK, it cannot be prescribed without a contraceptive and a negative pregnancy test. So just as we get towards the end, we're gonna talk about labels and categories. The government give, gives medications labels, which are definitely misleading. So you don't have to remember any of this, but there's this classification, A, B, C, D, really bad, X, definitely bad. But it's actually not a helpful classification. And why do I say that? Because some of the D medicines that I just have talked about, some of the medicines I've just talked about are D, but they're safe in pregnancies and others are not. And it's nearly half a decade ago that the US went, yeah, we're not happy with this and have made absolutely quantum leaps in how they label their medicines for pregnancy. And to date, the Australian authorities have not got any plans to make similar changes that I'm aware of. 
So in summary, just to let you know, the category which I just said D, I said hydroxychloroquine's pregnancy compatible, but the category is D. Sulfasalazine is A, compatible, azathioprine, yes. The tumor necrosis factors, yes. Methotrexate is a D, but it's absolutely not compatible with pregnancy. And when I say compatible with pregnancy, a person can get pregnant on it, but we do not want to because them to do that because of the risk to them and their baby. So what about fathers? Uh, the document, that I, the resource that I mentioned, we've got a few comments about fathers, but just in summary, sulfasalazine, the international experts recommend stopping only after three months of unsuccessful conception because that in some people it seems to reduce sperm motility. But poorly controlled disease also adversely affects the quality of sperm. Hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine seem to be safe. Methotrexate, there was a lot of information and anxiety about potential damage, but there are many, many pregnancies published now after paternal exposure and there does not appear to be any risk to the fetus. Leflunamide, there is limited published evidence, but it would seem also to be compatible. The TNF inhibitors, the biologics, again, there are more published data now, they seem to be safe. The synthetic are these newer medications and there's no data to base the recommendation. So, um, what about other types of arthritis? I talked about rheumatoid arthritis just briefly. The other group of arthritis, these spondyloarthritis, which include psoriatic arthritis, axial spondyloarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. And the recent data suggests that actually some of these patients do get worse, some get a bit better, and that there is some increased poor outcomes. And one of the concerning things in its early data is stopping the medication and a patient has a problem, restarting may not necessarily be enough to control the disease activity. So lupus or SLE. For anyone in the audience who has this disease, a few decades ago, it would have been said, you shouldn't have a pregnancy. However, if the disease is well controlled, the flares do not seem to occur, particularly for the six months before. Uncontrolled disease, increased risk of miscarriage, prematurity, low birth weight, preeclampsia. So I mentioned this before, but hydroxychloroquine, stopping it will increase disease activity and has poorer pregnancy outcomes for mum and baby. And it's considered safe for all lupus pregnancies and should be continued. Low-dose aspirin is recommended in patients with lupus and heparin, which is a blood thinner, can be indicated in some pregnancies. There is a specific antibody that's found in lupus and Sjogren's and this antibody called Rho positive can cause the baby's heart rate to slow. So if you have a lupus or Sjogren's and you have this antibody, you will be monitored and there are some babies that may need intervention like a pacemaker, but it is a, a treatment that is well recognized now and identified. So what I'm trying to say is, Let's think about the big picture. And certainly there are no doubt that some in the audience have already decided they're not gonna take any medications during pregnancy or breastfeeding because they, they want to protect their baby. What I hope is that perhaps in a decade on from when this was written, we now have enough evidence to support a mum with the decision that the balance might actually be in the interest of taking a pregnancy compatible medication, minimizing damage, and therefore producing uh, a better outcome for mum as well. So it's a big ugly world of Dr. Google out there. And I just wanna highlight that this was a decision aid written that said, 
anti-inflammatories shouldn't be used. Yet I just said to you, the British Society of Rheumatology and the European Society of Rheumatology and the American College of Rheumatology actually said, you can go ahead and breastfeed. Again, hydroxychloroquine considered harmful if used during pregnancy and breastfeeding. But the American College, the British College, the European, extremely safe for mother and fetus and should not be stopped before, during, or after pregnancy. So again, let's balance not being on a medication, the risk of flaring, and the damage of a flare altogether. There are specific situations to be very careful with. If, as a consequence of a rheumatic disease, a person has severely impaired kidney function or heart function or lung function, on balance, the decision may be to recommend, look, a pregnancy is going to risk you deteriorating your kidney function, so you might need a transplant or dialysis. Poorly controlled blood pressure, get the blood pressure controlled. Active rheumatoid, rheumatic disease, whether it's lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or the other, get it well controlled. But the end product that we would all like is a happy, healthy baby, a happy, healthy mum. And this is only going to come if there is an ongoing discussion between the patient centrally, the rheumatologist and the obstetrician. So um, the family planning. So if your disease has an increased risk of blood clot or thrombosis, as lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome have, or you've got high levels of inflammation, or there are other risk factors, there is some evidence to say don't take an estrogen containing contraceptive if there are other options available. So this is the resource that I'm not expecting you to read, but is on the ARA website. It links to a couple of other information sources. It's, it's very um, simple in that we only, I, you talk about some medications and we only talk about rheumatoid. We're hoping to extend this as a series. So we will have one about um, lupus, one about spondyloarthritis. So my summary is the best chance of a healthy baby and mum is well-controlled disease. Let's think about pregnancy compatible medications and let's be very careful about steroids. In an unplanned pregnancy, make sure you're managed with those who know the current state of the art and fathering children on DMARDs has not been associated with poor, poor pregnancy outcomes. And I think that might be my last slide, Jen. Yes, yes, we're, we're up to our questions now, Claire, and thanks so much. There was certainly a lot that you covered in your presentation, but that's the beauty of this webinar because everyone who registered for the webinar will receive the recording. It will also be available on our website to, for people to view in the future. So, um, you know, people can stop and think about things because you certainly provide such comprehensive information there. One thing that came to my mind, Claire, was also just um, understandably and interesting even some of the figures you talked about with regards to um, the numbers of women potentially of childbearing age who have rheumatoid arthritis in Australia and so on, is even just the levels of anxiety, and this is where this information will be, you know, very useful for many of these women, but um, the level of anxiety that must be experienced by some women who are maybe facing uh, this decision or, or may also experience a, an unplanned pregnancy. I suppose reassurance is a key element of, of your interaction with, with a young woman in a situation. I think it is important to be reassuring. Um, it's important to get the right people around you. So the right midwife, the right GP, the right pharmacist. It's a whole team together. And if we as rheumatologists spend time saying, look, you've got lupus and you should stay on your hydroxychloroquine. If your disease is well controlled, your outcome's gonna be the same as everyone else. And we come across a pharmacist or a GP or an obstetrician who goes on and they look up Dr. Google and it says category D, all that hard work, the patient then becomes extremely anxious again. And so, 
when I'm talking to someone, I try and empower them and show them the information so that, and I say, don't stop it. Whatever anyone says, don't stop it and come and talk to me and then we'll go through it again. So I, it is a, a very challenging decision, but we've got more evidence to try and help people come to um, a, a sensible decision for them and their baby. Hmm. And, and assuming that a, a, a person with RA is, is already um, with a treating rheumatologist, they would be obviously the most, you know, um, sensible person that to, would, you know, first have this discussion. Um, would you then, uh, in, in with your patients, Claire, would you refer them to an ob obstetrician who you know has a good understanding of, of, a, of a young woman in this situation? So um, there are a couple of um, obstetricians in our, in Brisbane who have been to talks that I've given and that's always a good thing because they're up to date. But I think the art is that the obstetrician communicates. So mm. as long as they're conveying, even if it's, look, I'm not sure, let's talk to your rheumatologist. I've even worked with IVF specialists about what is um, appropriate, what's acceptable. So I don't think you have to be a specialist obstetrician. I think there's going to be a few. Uh, the great service, and I can only speak locally, is um, the uh, preconception clinic at ours is the Royal Brisbane, but they have an excellent service where they will talk to mums who want to get pregnant. They will talk to mums and dads, partners who want to have and, and lay out all the pros and cons, or even if you've had an unfortunate outcome with a pregnancy. So you've had an early miscarriage and you've got rheumatoid. And we have to be aware that a third of all pregnancies, not just rheumatoid pregnancies, but end in a miscarriage. So it might not be that, but they will offer a service. And, and that referral can come from your GP, it can come from your obstetrician, it can come from your rheumatologist. And I'm not afraid to use that, even though I feel that I've got a reasonable handle on this. Um, because the more good information a person has, the better they're going to feel about the decisions they make. Hmm, exactly. And Claire, we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Um, sure. One person, one person has asked, is there any data on JIA and pregnancy or is rheumatoid arthritis a suitable proxy? So I guess for someone who maybe is currently diagnosed with JIA, thinking about the future, uh, what you've so outlined today. So yeah. that's a really, really good question. And the irony of it is my interest in this occurred when I had a beautiful young lady who came back from her honeymoon, having been diagnosed with JIA at the age of two and bad disease. So um, enough that had hip replacement and joint replacements in the 20s. And she came back from her honeymoon pregnant on uh, a targeted therapy. And this was a de more than a decade ago. So we didn't have information. And that's where my interest came from. So in my experience, I believe the best we can do is use rheumatoid arthritis as a proxy. Now, we all know those with JIA are not small people with rheumatoid. Absolutely. But the cohorts coming through in, that I've looked after, I would look after them with the, the, that in mind. Um, the medication that I mentioned that has just been a statement made should be used, can be used in breastfeeding and pregnancy, tocilizumab. That's one of the medicines that has been used for JIA. So I think uh, it's an excellent question, whoever asked it. Um, the best we can do at the moment is a proxy, um, but I don't think it's a barrier to, if, if you have JIA, and you're thinking about what my future might would how I would say, be optimistic. My patient has had two beautiful babies. Great, that's that's good news. Um, another question: um, If disease is well controlled, do the risks to the baby go back to population level, or are they still higher? 
they go back to the level of it depends on which which individual but they go close very close to the normal level okay um and also another question the toss yes data only from COVID and pregnancy is it only from COVID and pregnancy or has it been used in arthritis and pregnancy so it's been you used in about yeah so it's been used in arthritis and the party line from all international um, recommendations is we don't know enough there's probably no harm but it's not recommended but so because it's been black and white that it has saved lives in COVID. This recent recommendation has said in pregnancy, so it's it's an Australian, and if you go on, it's on the public section of the Australian COVID Alliance um, information, and I, I just found it yesterday, it says that uh, it shouldn't be a barrier to breastfeeding. Now, in my talk, I said in th no theoretical barrier, so I think they're extrapolating the same. So yes, it, there are pregnancies. There's been a, there was a paper in the uh, uh, Australian Rheumatology Association last year, or not last year, because no one did COVID, no, did last year, the year before, which had three pregnancies on tocilizumab. So I think if it's the only thing that works for you, I wouldn't have a hesitation. And then the decision is, do you continue it all the way through? If you continue it past the third trimester, then it would be recommended that the baby doesn't have live vaccines. And, uh, and Claire, another question, what dietary changes can be made to help or hinder arthritis during pregnancy? I don't think there's any specific evidence about dietary changes in pregnancy in the same way that there isn't any great data uh, apart from a diet that is rich in omega-3 in the general rheumatoid world. So there are lots of um, suggestions that maybe legumes or tomatoes or oranges, or diet alters. The only good quality evidence is a diet that's rich in omega-3. So I would say if you've got rheumatoid, then um, a happy, healthy diet would be a better approach. Um, one thing that does make a difference to uh, rheumatoid arthritis is exercise. So if you keep your exercise going during pregnancy, that's potentially a big plus in terms of lifestyle. Yep, okay, always very good advice, probably for, for any uh, conditions or, Everyone. or health. That's right, exactly. Um, now, you also mentioned, uh, Claire, that uh, there, there's quite sort of ongoing research and uh, quite a bit of research uh, happening in relation to uh, pregnancy and arthritis. Is there much actually happening in Australia or internationally? So um, the Americans have a great group in STAMP uh, in California run by Megan Klaus. And she's the lady who had used this medication or persuaded her patients who were on this medication to allow them and their offspring to be studied, which gave us this fantastic information. We have done, a group of us have done a study over the last five years looking at what patients, what were the outcomes for patients who had conceived or been exposed to targeted therapies. Um, and what we found is that many of them actually had their babies vaccinated and not one baby came to any harm. And we also found that a decade ago, no one was really sure about breastfeeding, but a lot of our mums did breastfeed. And now, of course, the shift is, well, absolutely, you should definitely breastfeed. So um, that was a small study in Australia. The there are these registries. So there's a fantastic registry in German called the Pregnancy Kiss Registry. And they are looking at collecting uh, as they go along contemporaneously, ideally all the pregnancies. So we're going to have more data. Um, the 
uh, Americans have an Otis registry, which isn't specific to rheumatoid, rheumatology, it's all medications, but they're the ones who collected the information on leflunamide or Arava that, you know, we were very anxious about it because of animal studies, but the uh, mums who've generously offered their data have been, um, it's been reassuring if you find yourself in that situation. Hmm. And I think we've actually come to the end of our questions for this evening. If anyone has any last minute questions, could you please um, uh, put them in the uh, the question box now? Um, so Claire, and of course, uh, all rheumatologists would be complete, always be updating their knowledge around pregnancy arthritis. I know rheumatologists are a great group that always work well together and share information and so on. So. Um, people can be reassured that whoever they're seeing, they, they should be well informed about the latest information and research around pregnancy and arthritis? Well, uh, Jen, it's a really good point. And I like the way you say it, they should, because they absolutely should. And it does lead into a little segue. <laughs> so in addition to the resource we have for um, patients and their families, We've had for the last decade a resource for prescribers, which was originally written when the information on methotrexate sort of accidental pregnancies or methotrexate not being quite so awful outcomes as one had thought. And we've updated it and our new resource should be going on the website um, in the next few days. Now, this is, it's not written for the general population, but if you want more information, and you want to arm yourself with more information when you go to your obstetrician or whoever, then it is on the ARA websites. It's under the GP section, but it has, so Jen, you're absolutely right. Everyone should be, but if you are with your obstetrician and you don't feel, sorry, you're with your rheumatologist and you don't feel terribly comfortable, then don't be afraid to go back to your GP and have a chat. And I've certainly had patients who have another rheumatologist, but that rheumatologist said, look, I'm not up to date with it. Why don't you go and have a chat with her? Or and my part, one of the other rheumatologists I work with, Dr. Laurel Young, we both have an interest in the area. So um, don't be afraid to go back to your GP or other members of your team. Be careful about, with the greatest respect, as I said to Jen, my husband is an obstetrician, um, he would say, I don't know, ask your rheumatologist. So be careful if the obstetrician is telling you something different, like, or oh, you shouldn't be on hydroxychloroquine plaquenol, then just take it, store the information, go back and talk to someone else. Mm. Yeah, and I think that um, I think that and I should just sort of say, Claire. Of course, when when we talk about ARA again, for everyone watching this webinar, we're referring to the Australian Rheumatology Association. So, um, so on their website, and and that's great. The resource from Arthritis Australia, and of course, we also have our MSK helpline uh, with nurses and so on. So, if anyone is struggling to find the information and so on we can also assist with directing them to any relevant information and so on. So uh, no further question. There is a last comment saying, thank you for a great talk and information, very useful. So I think that really probably sums it up for this evening. And, and Claire, I think um, this information is so vitally important because it's it's it would be, I can imagine, a great uh, an issue that could potentially cause great stress uh, for, for yeah. women in this position. So I think to have this information available is just incredibly important and, and particularly your focus on that issue of balance. I think um, yeah. you've made that point very clearly this evening and I, I think that's very valuable. So look, I well, would like to thank you on behalf of Muscular Legal Australia and, and also on behalf of the audience. I'd like to thank everyone for joining this evening. Uh, can I remind you, if you could just uh, complete the uh, short feedback survey that will come on your screens at the end of this webinar and remind you, actually, there was a question on diet tonight and our next webinar towards the end of May will be on the issue of diet and musculoskeletal conditions. So, um, you know, that's, that's always a question that comes up in, in, in various sort of settings. So um, hopefully that will also be of great value as this evening's webinar was to everyone. So thanks very much, Claire. Have a good evening and I wish good evening and good night to everyone else.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.